Welcome to the Home Business Podcast with Richard Captain Henderson, publisher of Home Business Magazine, and Sherilyn Colleen, managing editor. This how-to show helps you successfully operate your home-based business. Greetings and welcome to the Home Business Podcast. I'm Richard Captain Henderson, your skipper at Home Business TV. And I'm Lynn, your co-host. Let's secure, foresee, and get underway. 80 to 90% of new startups will fail. While there are many reasons for this, one of the biggest problems new ventures face are poor negotiation skills. According to Samuel Dinar, a Harvard instructor and business mediator, the single biggest threat to success is an inability to handle the negotiations that arise in the evolution of a startup. Home-based entrepreneurs must be able to prevent, detect, and respond to potential negotiation mistakes in each of their interactions. In his new book, Entrepreneurial Negotiation, Understanding and Managing the the Relationships that Determine Your Entrepreneurial Success, Dinar points to the mix of emotion, uncertainty, complexity, and relationships that make negotiations so difficult. So, greetings, Samuel Dinar. Welcome to the Home Business Podcast. Say hello to our audience. (laughs) Hello, everybody. Hello, Richard. Hello, Lynn. Great to be here. Yeah, thanks for coming on our show. So you're co- you're uh, connecting in from the bustling metropolis of Boston, Massachusetts. I am, <laughs> I am indeed. In uh, chilly Boston, Massachusetts, not as chilly as Minnesota these yeah, days. Yeah, just chilly, <laughs> chilly, chilly uh, everywhere we get to celebrate a Super Bowl. So I understand Boston is kind of a startup hub. It's kind of a entrepreneurial hub with more of a you know more of a technical um, edge to it. Right? Indeed. Um, well, Boston is a very uh, very deep technology based uh, uh, environment here and has really excelled at, at focusing on entrepreneurship of complex technology over the years. This started with uh, the early days of aerospace research at MIT, uh, computer science research, um, telco, life sciences, and today within a, a very small radius around Boston, you have just an incredible ecosystem of startups, entrepreneurships. Um, and a lot of technologies company, technology companies from around the world. And a good Super Bowl team. Well, I think you're our first guest to dial in from Boston, so welcome aboard today. Well, my pleasure. Yep. Samuel, they say everything in life is negotiable. Why is the ability to negotiate crucial in growing a startup or other enterprises? Well, um, as your listeners know, and as you yourselves know, starting a business, a home business or any business, requires you to Uh, harness a lot of resources that you don't necessarily have. Well, a business person that manages a project may be assigned some people and assign some uh, a budget. As As an entrepreneur, you have to negotiate even for that. You have to negotiate with people to join you before you can promise them a salary. You could have to negotiate with people to give you money to invest in your business in order to be able to start and grow the business. So entrepreneurship from the very early days requires negotiation, and that evolves and continues throughout the life of a startup. You know, that's a good way of looking at it. I always kind of looked at negotiation. You, you default to sales and selling and that kind of negotiation, but it permeates every aspect of a startup. And even, you know, bringing in the, the products and services you need to get your business launched, finding talent. Every bit of that uh, re- requires you to negotiate for it. You're not, you're not like a larger company that might have <laughs> set contracts or this or that. You've got to negotiate for everything. Exactly. And, and what we've done is we've interviewed a lot of entrepreneurs. And when we say we, I have to acknowledge my great uh, co-author partner, uh, Professor Larry Suskind, who's at MIT and one of the co-founders of the program of negotiation at the Harvard Law School, where we both teach. Um, We've identified that as as a leader of a small business, as an entrepreneur, you are actually negotiating with a set group of people time and time again. You're negotiating with people who need to come and be your external backers, invest in the company or support you from the outside. You need to bring people inside. You need to hire employees to be your backbone insiders that work on the company. You need to align the partners that will help you communicate and reach out to the external world. They need to be on the front line selling for you or procuring for you or negotiating on your behalf. And of course, the outsider, those potential customers, potential employees, potential uh, partners that you're trying to bring in, sell on the vision and bring on board of the team. 
So, so it sounds like from when, when you wake up in the morning to when you go to bed at night, <laughs> if you're an entrepreneur, you're going to be negotiating. And uh, that's just part of the, uh, got to be part of the blood steam for this. Well, you know, Sammy, you say entrepreneurs make eight key mistakes when they negotiate. You know, what is different about the way entrepreneurs negotiate? Um, so entrepreneurs, um, like any negotiators, um, lead and negotiate according to their culture, their personal preferences, their biases. What the self-selection that happens in people that go out and set their own business is very interesting, and especially in technology businesses, but any business elsewhere, they tend to be more optimistic, more confident in going out there and doing their thing. They have learned to depend on being self-starters and have had successes being self-starters and working on their own and achieving great results. So the mistakes that they tend to make are, are slightly different than regular business people or regular negotiator elsewhere. And we list those eight mistakes after having done extensive interviews and after having combed the research, we've listed the eight common mistakes that we see entrepreneurs make in negotiations. Well, good. I mean, that, that's a good place to put a plug in for the book to uh, read the book and get a little more detail on these uh, eight mistakes that uh, entrepreneurs make when they negotiate. Yep. Yep. And, and, uh, and, you know, to your earlier comment, um, we went with this concept to Ed Roberts, who founded the Entrepreneurship Center at MIT and is a great entrepreneur and angel investor over the years himself. And he's analyzed the impact of the ecosystem of entrepreneurship on the economy. And he said, you're absolutely right. We've never looked at entrepreneurship through the lens of negotiation, and we haven't treated negotiation as a critical skill. But in fact, many of the startups and many of the entrepreneurs he's worked with have failed not because the technology wasn't right or the market wasn't ready for the product. It was because some basic relationship um, failed, whether it's between the co-founders themselves or with the investors or with a major customer, um, one of these relationships. So the key in the book is exactly like you said in the opening, is how to understand and manage these key relationships. Samuel, what are the most common mistakes that entrepreneurs tend to make? Well, the, the first one is they tend to be very self-centered. They, they really know how to advocate their case. They know how to make their pitch. They know how to say what they need or what they want and they don't spend enough time thinking about the other side, their needs, their wants, their interests. The second is they get overly confident, over-optimistic, or over-trusting that things that go well. The third mistake we found is also will be sound natural for you, especially if you're looking at the technology sector or the life sciences sector, they tend to be very competitive. So they want to win and they want to win now. And sometimes they don't spend enough effort thinking about the long-term implications of their behavior at the negotiation table. Yeah, I hear that term, win-win negotiation. I That's just was right. thinking about that when you said the term winning. Exactly. So, so um, at the program on negotiation at Harvard that started 40 years ago, we, we're, we're considered the, the mecca of negotiation theory and practice over the years because we started building on Roger Fisher, Bill Urey, and the greats who founded the program with the concepts of mutual gains negotiation, win-win as opposed to win-lose, not looking, which is mistake number six, not looking at it as a haggle. I'll start high, you'll start low, I'll threaten, we'll come back a little, we'll compromise somewhere in the middle, which is usually a compromise that may be worse for both sides than coming up with a creative option that would add more value. So absolutely win-win. Yeah, a lot of times I hear about negotiation, it's learning how to manage the expectations and, you know, like going into something that, you know, if you don't set up some ground rules or expectations in advance with who you're negotiating, it will end up in a flea market with low and high and, and confusion. I mean, what do you think about that point with managing expectations? Absolutely. Um, one thing we sort of, so in the book, we, as you said in the opening, we don't just say what the mistakes are. We actually... Um, prescribe you ways to prevent the mistakes, ways to detect when they're about to happen, and what to do in order to respond and correct the effect when they do happen, because we're all bound to make mistakes. And That's the last thing is, how do you reflect and learn from those mistakes? 
So you're absolutely right in that one of the things that we advise people to do is negotiate your negotiation process. Negotiate your process of negotiation. Negotiate your expectations and the norms you want to be using in the negotiation. Because every one of the home businesses that your viewers operate is different. They operate in a very different context. You can't say these are the norms you should use everywhere. They're going to have to adapt to their particular context. And so negotiating the process and negotiating the expectations are key to a successful process. Well, these are some great points. We've talked a little bit about the mistakes people make. So, you know, so Sanya, how can negotiators, nego- entrepreneurs uh, channel some of this to you know, learn to negotiate better? Um, so the last thing we mentioned was how to reflect on your negotiations. After you have finished a negotiation, go through a post-action debrief. Figure out what went well what you would do differently, what lessons learned can you extract from how you behaved, how the other side behaved, what dynamics happened in the negotiation. And then doing that on a repeated basis will allow you to develop your own theory of practice of how to negotiate, how to understand yourself better as a negotiator, your strengths and the things that you need to maybe get help with um, and team up with others in order to succeed. You know, I think that's really important in the military. We call that the after action report, that's where right. it's really important to, you know, look at how you're doing and get that feedback loop back into yourself and to improve your negotiations. And the next time you, you, you go up to bat negotiating something. Absolutely. And in the military, um, you have to adapt to a changing environment. And we quote in the book, Churchill or Eisenhower. Oh, there we go. <laughs> planning. <laughs> what better planning examples? Is, planning is really important because when you're planning, you're thinking about everything that could go wrong and how you're going to handle it. But eventually, the plan is not that important because as soon as battle starts or as soon as the negotiation gets underway, you find out new information and you're going to have to adapt and adjust. And negotiation is usually not just one meeting. So in between meetings, you can do this post-action debrief, review what you've done, think how you're going to correct this in the next meeting, and again, prevent mistakes in the next meeting, detect them when they're happening, and reflect on them afterwards. Yeah, I think the key thing is you don't want to be making the same mistake twice. You know, if you learn something of what you're doing, cycle it back and focus on, you know, continuous improvement with that. So the nice thing about the book is that we have interviewed a lot of entrepreneurs in, in, in the region here, um, a diverse group of entrepreneurs, different ages, different races, different industries. And we've ended up putting eight of these cases in the book, including the video interviews themselves. So you can actually hear from entrepreneurs, share their mistakes, what they have done and how they made these mistakes early on. But these are successful entrepreneurs and brave, I must say, for willing to share this information. And they have also shared how they learned from it and what corrective action they have put in place. So you can learn from actually watching these videos or reading that story and figuring out this is how they corrected it. Maybe I can adjust that for myself or maybe I can learn how to learn. Um, I remember fishing in Lake Vermilion, your neck neck of the woods. There we go. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And I took my son with me and it wasn't that we caught fish and gave him the fish. We taught him how to fish, right? right? We want to teach people how to learn from their mistakes so they can improve. But so you can learn from watching others make mistakes, but you have to get in the habit of reflecting on your own actions and, and learning from that. Point. Kind of going off on that on preparing and learning from your mistakes, one way to better negotiate is to better prepare. Samuel, what is the best way for an entrepreneur to prepare for a negotiation? Well, the, one of the key things is to um, think about all perspectives not think about your perspective only and not only think about your interests. So spend half as much time thinking about the negotiation problem from the other side. What are their interests? What are their needs? What are their wants? What are the pressures that they are seeing from their back table, the people they have to report to or get approval from? If you spend enough time thinking about those two things, then you can spend enough time, some time thinking about the process and how you're going to negotiate your process, as we said before, in order to be successful. And so we have an actual checklist at the end of the book 
for how to prepare from the three different perspectives for a negotiation, and then how to go about thinking about your mistake, thinking about your biases, and incorporating that into building your own negotiation practice. Let's dive into this a little bit more. You know, negotiation ends up being a, you know, a two-way battle of wits. Why, you know, why is it absolutely essential to understand the other's participant's viewpoint in the negotiation? All right. Well, two points there that I'd like to touch on. Um, the first is the metaphor that you've used, which is a battle of wits, <laughs> which again comes from a, a military model or a sport model, right? The Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. One team is going to win, one team is going to lose. Mm -hmm. But rather in negotiation, you can actually get to a win-win situation. If you go in thinking with a win-lose model, then you are likely to fulfill that prophecy because your behavior will get competitive, you will be thinking scarcity, and that will project to the other side, and they will get defensive, and they will behave that way. So maybe it's kind of, maybe don't look at it as a battle of wits, but that there's a challenge of wits. You know? exactly. <laughs> that right. Each person is going to be on their game to, to represent their own best interests. Right. And so, so beyond that, you're trying to look at, to formulate it as a joint problem solving. You're trying to actually be on the same side, as if you're both sitting on the side looking at the problem and thinking, how do I solve this problem in a way that's good for you and great for me, which is the title of my co-author's uh, prior book, right? So, but it can't, it, we won't reach agreement if the deal is going to be bad for you. Unless I have real coercive powers over you, you're not going to agree to a deal that's bad for you. So anything we come up with is going to need to be good for you and good for me, right? Got to so be win-win. Right. And, that's, and, and the attitude is one of joint problem solving. Get the facts, get the interests, and explore, brainstorm various options, various packages. Try to add more items. Try to, um, you know, if you find something that you care a lot about and the other side doesn't, really care about, then maybe you can get that. But the vice versa is absolutely true. If I find something that you really care about and I don't, I don't want to start holding that away for you. I, I want to find value in that by trading that with you for something that I care more deeply about. I really like that nugget you mentioned, the term problem solving. I think yeah. that, that's a good way to build two-way and, and build interest with who you're negotiating if you identify their problem and help them resolve that through the negotiation process. I think that's an excellent point. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. I agree. And that, that's, that's, a, that's a good way to look at any kind of interaction and the mental model you go in with is very important, and the first few mean, minutes of a negotiation are a good predictor of the outcome. And that's why I think going in, framing it as we've got a problem to solve together here, you for your company, me for my company, how are we going to accomplish that is the best opening you could, you could have as far as the mindset. Samuel Dinar, this has been a great discussion on being better negotiators. Do you have any final points you would like to share? Um, well, I, the, the book talks about entrepreneurship, and we started about how that is very close to starting your own home business, which is what you're, where your viewers are, are dealing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but the, the concepts in that book will change the way you negotiate, not only in business. It, they, will, they will improve the way you manage relationships in other areas in life, in your nonprofit endeavors, in your community in your family life. So we are all negotiators. <laughs> and understanding that and learning these tips and these tools is really important. Howard Stevenson, who founded entrepreneurship at the Harvard Business School, in his blurb, he read an early copy, and his blurb about the book, he says, this is not just for entrepreneurs. This is for anybody who's trying to sell, buy, or establish a relationship. And so I think negotiation is a real important life skill not just the home business skill. Everything in life is negotiable. Well, Samuel Dinar, thank you for being such a great guest on the Home Business Podcast. Thank you for uh, hosting me, and I hope uh, 
um, we'll get better weather and we'll have good sports results uh, coming up in the next few weeks for everyone. Amen. <laughs> to learn more about Samuel Dinar and his book, Entrepreneurial Negotiation, visit www.entrepreneurialnegotiation.com, our website for more information on guests. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the Home Business Podcast. Share your feedback with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and at our website, homebusinessmag.com. Visit the website for information on advertising, subscribe to our newsletter, Please visit our sponsors. For more info, visit homebusinessmag.com or the expo at homebusinessexpo.com. I'm Richard Captain Henderson saying anchors away. We'll talk with you soon. Until then, make it a great home-based biz day. <laughs>